Good afternoon, everybody, on this windy spring afternoon in Brookline. I'm Susan Howard, a domestic violence attorney with an office in Brookline. And this is the Safety Net, Brookline interactive groups show dedicated to educating and informing the public about domestic violence. Adam Sarah is our producer. The content is the guests and mine. And with us today is Marion Friedman Gerspan. Welcome, Marion. Thank you. And Marion has a little bit of a really, really fabulous background, some domestic violence in her background, which she's really a mental health guru. We had a discussion in the last week and I learned so much. Marion, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You grew up in Philadelphia? I grew up in Philadelphia, went to school at Bryn Mawr, then went to New York to Columbia to graduate school in social work. And then I moved up here in 1967. I lived in Cambridge for 20 years, and then I moved to Brookline. And I've been here ever since in the same apartment in Coolidge Corner. And, uh, and you have a daughter, right? A very I have a daughter, daughter whom you interviewed a, a few years ago, who's That's now it. working in Washington. And um, she was adopted from Honduras, but at nine months lived her whole life in Brookline until she went to college. Wow. And tell us a little bit about your professional background, which is huge and very wide. Okay. So I spent most of my time in mental health. I started out in community planning, working for United Community Services, which was the planning arm of the United Way. And it was a terrific introduction because I got to learn all the agencies in Boston, all the settlement houses, and I worked in collaboration with the anti-poverty program. And so I got to know what they were doing. Um, and we had conferences for the neighborhood organizations to talk about what their concerns were. So it, it was a terrific introduction to a city that I hadn't known. Then I worked for a year at... Uh, youth services because somebody from the agency had moved over. And then I got recruited to work at the Department of Mental Health. I started out in drug rehabilitation, but then uh, moved into child, with a few steps along the way, moved into child and adolescent mental health services. Although I'm a social worker and I'm licensed as an independent clinical practitioner, I would say I wouldn't send anybody to me. My background is really in planning and program development. I'm I'm really with that, I've learned so much from you, but I have to ask you the, the big question. All we read about now is the crisis post COVID. It might've been pre COVID, I don't know. Crisis in mental health resources, mainly for I'd say adolescents, but I'm not sure. And teenagers, I would imagine it's for adults too. I read these horrific articles in the paper that kids are waiting eight to 12 weeks in the emergency room corridor to get a bed, to find somebody to help them, blah, blah, blah. Can you address that? Why did this happen? Was it so prevalent before? This so is a long-term, pro this problem did not just arise. Okay. Uh, there, it, it's very complex. Um, there are Part of it is the, the, the beginning and the end is money. And so uh, pig, social workers who are the bulk of the, provide the bulk of the services are paid $40,000, $50,000 a year coming out of school with a master's degree. It's like, who wants to go into the profession? And if they do go into it, they work for their two years to get licensed so they can bill insurance. And then they go into private practice where they can charge whatever they want. They may take insurance or they may not. And a lot of social workers and psychologists and psychiatrists will not take insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so there's... If you can afford it and pay, you know, two hundred dollars a visit out of pocket, fine. But most people can't, and so there's a backup. There's also there's systemic issues in that 
when someone is licensed or accepted by insurance has the credentials to be re yeah. for insurance to pay for them there's not one credentialing each insurance agency has its own steps they're not radically different but they're enough for them to say oh sue you can be on my plan marion you can't we're both working in the clinic there's a free spot i've got an hour free but your insurance doesn't cover me it only covers her so people are a waiting list for that kind of reason um i would say so, that Marian, what about these kids they say that are waiting in emergency room corridors okay that's, that's a different that's a different problem <laughs> um they're they're all they're all related and that one though goes back really to deinstitutionalization. So in, in the 1960s, I'll take you way back, we had the Community Mental Health Center Act with President Kennedy. And we were going to provide services in the community and we were going to close state hospitals. And it worked for many people and many people did not need to be there. And some people did need to be there. And even those who didn't need to be there could be in the community, provided they had intensive services. Right. We never funded. It was seen, it got transmuted as to, well, it's cheaper. Well, it's cheaper for the state. Yeah, if the state's not running the operation, but somebody else is paying for it. Wait, Marion, are you saying that, that the theory was it would be cheaper to, to have people in the community right. with... It's cheaper, but who paid the people in the community? Well, that's the question. So no one ever looked at the total cost of care for the individual. There was right. a lot of cost shifting. So, yeah, it was cheaper for the state not to have to run these big institutions with these old-fashioned heating systems. And the State Bureau of Ed provided the education services. Well, when you put the kids in the community, you know what? The local school system was responsible. So and, and the prisons, I can tell you in the 90s and the early 2000s, many people who had been institutionalized, had been released exactly when they, the, the place had been shut down, ended up in the county jails because there was nothing else to put them. Well, and it's it, I can be very cynical about it, but it, it, you know the short form. The short story is you can't replace three shifts of paid staff with one unpaid mother, and it usually landed on the woman, on the woman in the house, the mother or the grandmother or the aunt. Um, Ruth Nemsoff, who lives in Brookline, had done a study about how the burden of deinstitutionalization fell on women, and as these women aged. They were incapable of doing what they may have been able to do for a 20 year old or a 30 year old. And we, we just, and then we, I just want to go on. Then there were changes at the federal level in funding and what got funded. And so some community services that had been funded uh, were cut in the 80s. And then the recession, the real killer for Massachusetts was the recession in 2008. And for whatever reason, the Department of Mental Health took the brunt of it. It just got decimated. And we have barely caught up to that level of funding, and particularly in children's services. So it's it's coming every which way. And the other problem that um, one of the things we lost with deinstitutionalization was the ability to deal with very complex children. So there were children who were, and I'm speaking for children because that's the group I know, you know, I know best. Um, there were children who were had serious mental health problems, but who were also what we then called mentally retarded. What does they that were, mean? What does that they mean? were intellectual. They had an intellectual disability. Well, at, when it was. In an institution, you could deal with it. You could deal with the child who was autistic and mentally ill. Once you go into the community, the different agencies have different funding streams from the Fed, starting at the feds, but then mimicked at the state level of we treat this, we don't treat that. 
you know, if you've got if you've got the two things, it's a rule out and and small community programs also don't have the capacity also to deal with they're not orphan things, they're not unique, unique, but they're they require specialized services. And if you've got a program for 12 people or 50 people, even you don't have the staff with the knowledge and the expertise to manage. And those are the kids that are waiting. The kids who are waiting tend yep. to be children with complex needs, either complex physical need, mental health and physical needs, or um, autism or some other disability combined with a mental health problem. Marianne, and, and then the, the very aggressive children and right. nobody wants them. What? I'm going to ask you a question. You said it begins and ends with money. What can we do about this? Because I think this is leading up to an increase that we've seen in domestic violence incidents. I think, and this I'm way out of line probably here, I think it's leading up to all we hear about these horrible, horrible school shootings is the shooter, the perpetrator was mentally ill, had mental, mental challenges. What are we going to do about this? Well, the state, has, in the last couple of years, the state has really put money in the last budget, put a lot of money into children's mental health. So there's, there are bright sides. It's never... Um, it's never all negative, you know. If some people benefit from a program, some people don't. The money that's gone in, there's been money put in for mental for to develop consultation, technical assistance to the schools around dealing with mental health problems. Some very sophisticated people who know that it because you're not going to deal with each kid. You've got to be able to deal with the school culture. It's what happens when they walk in the door? Are, are children yelled at because they're not standing in line the right way, which is what used to happen when I was a kid, you know, get in line? Or do we say, oh, it's so great to see you. How are you today? You know, hope right. everything's okay. Or pull them aside and say, you look really upset. You know, do you want to talk? Did something happen? Do you want to talk? There's got to be some... Schools have the resources to do this? Do they have the social workers? Do they have the counselors? I don't think they do. Oh, it's all, and that's why, you know, to mention politics, the school override issue is a big one in Brookline. Yes, it is. And I know you're active in Brookline. But jumping off to domestic violence, I know that you're also extremely knowledge about the trans community. Uh, and I'm very concerned about domestic violence, bullying, um, harassment within the trans community because I don't think that there are enough resources, that there's enough um, outsourcing, that people are really talking about it or concerned about it. I see it in my practice. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about what oh, goes on. It's higher. I mean, the rates of domestic violence are, hard, are higher in the trans community. Um, we have but some, and it starts at the family level. Um, I had written a, an essay for a book called Transformations of the Heart, which was an interview with 20 essays by 20 or 25 parents of trans children. Um, most of the people who agreed to write for the book were very accepting of their children. The religious fundamentalists across the board, didn't matter what religion, or not, they would say, I love my child. My child can't live in the house. It's against my religion. And this was, a, you know, across religions. Uh, and you look at that and you say, what are we going to do? Where do the child, and, where do they go? Where do they go? Street, well, street. there's been some programs, you know, small programs set up for them. You have to develop other resources you find communities uh, in Boston, uh, Bagley provides support groups. It used to be called Boston area and gay, lesbian, youth. They do, they serve statewide. And at this point, they're consulting nationwide. Um, the GSAs in the school, I don't know what they're called now, but they give, we're support, uh, Gay Student Alliance is what it used to be called. I'm not, I'm not up to date. Um, yeah. It's a support 
network in schools of children who are on the GLBTQ whatever and um, and their allies because it takes a group and it's that kind of uh, service of wraparound of finding community making community um, and it, it's a lot of work and people you have to know the individual child and where they fit in um, I want to talk put in something about domestic violence not specifically trans related but going back to the stuck children one of the reasons that children get stuck in hospitals when who are ready for discharge is the issue of sibling of intersibling violence and the reason parents will play will say i they'll the clinician will say the kid's ready to go home stable and the mother will say i can't he attacks the siblings or he attacks the, the dog or the cat and that's and that and that counts. They keep him there because he may they may be family issues. Well, the family will say, I can't, the mother will say, I can't take him home because he's gonna murder somebody and he's gonna attack somebody in this house. So what, and what it's they not do? looked at. I mean, and that's domestic there is domestic violence, you know, as you know, within families, but within kids. I mean, there's the normal sibling rivalry, whatever, and then there's out of control. Uh, right. sibling fighting and if they're different if they're mentally ill if they're trans or whatever the likelihood is higher so i have a question for you if the if the hospital or the clinician or whomever says by the way johnny or susie's ready to go home and mom says no he's not or she's not or they're not because they're going to attack somebody how can the clinician say then they're not ready to go home i don't understand and you look for another place and it's what you should, but we did have, and I don't know whether people, what the simple answer was you filed a 51A against the mother and said, you got to take them home. We put a rule into place saying hospitals, you can't do that. You've got to have somebody come in. You've got to have a consult. There was a whole process put into place as with many processes, you know, people leave. I'm not sure anybody remembers what file drawer it's in, but I used it several times and would fax the ruling to hospitals and say, you can't do this. You you have to have these people come in and there has to be a plan there are certain residential programs um and you may okay. not like the idea of residential but it's a safe place you have to you have to assure the safety of everybody not just the identified client but the family but wait a second how can they use the word ready if there's still an issue with the family then to me they are not ready Right, but they may never be ready for that family. They may be ready in another setting. Okay. So it's sometimes it's as long as you keep them out of that location, they're okay. But how many of the of these alternate places are there? Obviously not enough because you read about kids lined up, and I don't even know if this is true because I haven't taken the time to go and visit a hospital, but um, it's really sort of scary as far as well, I'm they concerned. they can't hire. I mean, the, the Department of Mental Health has put out bids <laughs> for programs and no one's responded. Part of it is the pay scale. I mean, we're not competitive. I mean, let's face it. If you can get an easy job answering the phone, filling uh, orders for L.L. Bean, I remember just talking to the people in Maine, that, a clean job where you're sitting in an air conditioned office working right. in what might not be in, in, in un -air con an un air conditioned space where kids may be throwing punches at you. What are you going to take? Exactly. And we don't, as a, as a society right now, the whole emphasis is on STEM. If we did want, and we sort of denigrate the caring professions it's like beneath when you, you failed as a woman if you're just in a caretaking profession and Ooh. that's but that's you know if you listen to what's being said i mean it, the whole thing is oh no you're worth more you can do more than that well the implication is caretaking is a they call caretaking professions are lesser 
So this is a huge problem that I guess I'm putting words in your mouth that you don't really see a final stage of. This is going to go on and on, correct? Well, go on. I think that there'll be corrections. There'll be improvements in one area and backsliding in another, or maybe and maybe some improvements across the board. I don't want to be. I mean, it, it's always changing the bat. You know, you're always trying to balance with not enough. I think there will be increases. Okay, I I think salaries will increase. I don't know what's going to happen with the media. What I'd like to see is a media blitz, not just saying we're offering uh, starting bonuses, but really looking at the salaries. There has been some movement there. There's. Um, I think the legislation passed for loan forgiveness, which is a big item for uh, graduate social workers. So oh. it, it's it's looking at it's looking at reimbursement rates, and then you're looking at Medicaid funding. I mean, you're you're dealing with the feds, you're dealing with the state, um, and you, you, you know, private providers don't have money of their own; they're dependent on contracts and community and community money. And some do better than others. Uh, some some have more community support How than is others. Brookline? How does Brookline stand up? And you don't have to answer if I'm putting you on the spot. I think pretty well. I think that people have supported the Brookline Center. Um, what made me sad is the Brookline Center has a brilliant program for children leaving acute care psychiatric hospitals and transitioning to the high school. It won national awards, but it was never picked up as a state model. We kept pushing it. It's like, come on, this is such a such a needed program. It's been researched. It's it's shown its value. So it's very hard. The the mental, I, I mean, people can question the rigor of the medical world, but we're nowhere near that on mental health of, uh, you know, evidence-based treatment and everybody is, you know, come on, guys, this is it, and this is what you have to do. Um, so have you seen any reduction in the number of applicants to social work programs, say, in colleges and universities because of the low salary, because they're not really... I don't, I don't know, but I know that even people who've had grants had had a very hard time recruiting minority students because yeah. min, uh, because minority students are um, the prime. It's what everybody's looking for. So they're being recruited in other fields as well that can offer more. Oh, wow. We're talking to Marion Friedman Gerstmann, who's not just a social worker. But she's also a planner, a policy planner, and she's a teacher. Didn't you teach? Yeah, I for I taught a few courses at BU in uh, at the Graduate School of Social Work and Community Organizing, which really encompasses poly and pl policy and planning. And then I filled in for the uh, policy person, mental the person who teaches at Mental Health Policy when he was on sabbatical at Salem State. So and you also do work with immigrants at, at right. the Gables in Salem? What the, is house of, so the House of the Seven Gables, which people may know as a historic house, and you go and see the oldest wooden house, um, was created. Its formal name is the House of the Seven Gables Settlement Association. And it was created as a settlement house to help the immigrants acculturate it was a live-in, staff used to live in with the people with the old settlement house model and then became a service providing organization. Um, this, the initial group, and it ran daycare programs, ran summer camps. Um, it has the bringing the historic house on campus and opening it as a museum was meant as a way to fund the settlement house activities. Uh, and now the maintenance of a historic house costs so much that there's less money going into the settlement um, activ activities because all houses take a lot of work. The focus now is um, on literacy and citizenship right. and also, um, commun also community discussions around immigration um, and immigration issues. 
the immigrant population has changed. This is, when this house opened, it was Eastern European. It's now mostly Dominican, but at the naturalization ceremony, there are Haitians, there are uh, people from Poland, there are Russians, as well as, you know, a lot of Spanish speakers, but yeah. So in the last couple of minutes that we have, Marion, what do you see as the most serious problem in Brookline that, that domestic violence is affected by? Or, or seniors? What do you see in the senior population? Well, I think people, I think people need support. So we've gotten, uh, we know the senior center is for more social work because people are, you know, um, started with COVID, seniors are isolated. I think it's, um, so there's that issue. There's a group that's working. We know, you and I know about, um, abuse of seniors, financial abuse by caretakers. Uh, yeah. I think we need hands on, uh, eyes on individuals. And how are you going to do that? It's, that's why I said it begins and ends with money. You're going to have to, um, you're going to have to have some systems in place to look, some screening systems, much more systematized than hearing a complaint, whether it's intake or just as an interview, you meet people, it's like, come, we're trying to gather basic information about our residents, who's doing that, who's doing, you know, who's doing what, and somebody to give to give a look and there should be i think you could do uh some trigger points that you would say yeah you know this is, this isn't right um but just you know if somebody has a bank you know has a bank account and you just i don't know you call the bank and just say look at it and just you know we're just checking you know to look and make sure you can't say can you say they just have, look it over no you the, the the owner of the bank account uh the bankee has to give you a release to do that either whether it's a power of attorney or something I, I wouldn't want the social worker to do it i would want the banker to say look at it as they look at other you know bizarre withdrawals <laughs> i get I calls know. i get calls for economic abuse a lot but then when you get down to it, they come into the office, they give me the story, blah, blah, blah. They don't want to go forward. Well, she's a caretaker. I need her. My family can't help me. Or it's my son-in-law. I don't want to upset the family. Or it's my daughter. She doesn't mean any. Meanwhile, thousands of dollars are gone. And they don't want to go forward. And they sort of disappear. I mean, elder abuse to me is the best kept secret because of the elders. I mean, I don't know that I would want to want to spin on my family. I really don't. Oh no! I mean, it's a choice of is it the money or the care? You're more dependent on the care than the money. You're not going to be there. You exactly. Know? Exactly. Um, but I'm just the- saying, sy- systemically, do banks look? You know, do we put something in place so that everybody over eighty gets a special re- or over seventy, whatever gets? The bank has some system where they regularly review withdrawals and look at something that's... I don't know, but I'm going to ask my bank. Brookline Bank has been really fabulous because people have tried to... They call you when there's anything unusual going on. That's right. And so do they have a system in place where they can um, look for anything unusual, like a regular scan, the way your computer gets scanned, you know, we, we run it and, and see if there's anything weird going on but it's as, a good a prevention, idea. as a prevention kind of thing. I think that's what we're talking about when we talk, we're looking about broad scale interventions, group, you know, prevention things. Community interventions, you're saying. We really are our neighbors. We have to watch out for our neighbors. Marion Friedman Gersman, how do we get in touch with you? And do you want people getting in touch with you if they have mental health questions, trans questions? They can ask me, but I'm retired. I've been retired for 10 years I'm, or 12 years, I guess. I'm not in the middle of it, but they they can certainly call me. And okay. And phone number, do you want to give it out? Yeah, for sure. 617-734-5468. Um, 
my husband will probably may answer the phone. He's also a retired social work and social worker and did a lot of work with seniors. So, oh, that's good, Marion Freeman. You'll come back. Thank you so much for sharing the wealth of your experience and knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank that's you. It.